Open up, if you would, this morning, please, to Matthew chapter 6, as we continue in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, We're spending six weeks in the Sermon on the Mount. This is part three of our six-week series, and here is what we have on tap today. Our theology today is this, religion with the praise of men as the reward is not faith in Jesus. Religion with the praise of men as the reward is not faith in Jesus. Our application today is this, seek the reward that is eternal and found in God and the faith that is rooted in Christ. And our prayer today is, God, give us the discipline to live our lives, not for the glory of men, but for your glory. The Sermon on the Mount we've talked about the last two weeks is not uh, to be taken as Christian instruction. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus as a Jew addressing Jews. He is, uh, he is beginning his public ministry. Uh, If we put the parallel text together with that of Luke, it is likely that Jesus, having just recently preached in a synagogue, his very first sermon, uh, recorded sermon for us in Luke 4, is Jesus reading from Isaiah 61. And Jesus, having read from Isaiah 61, says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of the sight to the blind. And he says, Hey, guess what, everybody? The scripture's fulfilled and you're hearing of it. So he just says, I'm this guy, I'm the Messiah, and the people in the synagogue are not having it. And they take him outside and they're going to throw him off a cliff to kill him. And Jesus being Jesus and it not being his time to die, the Bible says, passes through their midst. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't tell us how, but he's God, right? So they're taking him to the edge of the cliff and intending to kill him. He passes through their midst unscathed, comes to a hillside, and a group of people gather around, and then he preaches and teaches what we call Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. You know, if we were to just read this uh, straight through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, I bet we could do it in about 15 minutes, the whole thing. And here he is, a 15-minute sermon, right, Uh, that is life-altering for these Jews who are listening. Because the Jews who are listening, their mindset is, is that the Pharisees are righteous. In fact, the Pharisees' mindset is that they're righteous. The Pharisees are this self-righteous group of people. They're kind of the religious leaders of the day. And they believe that they are righteous because of the works that they are doing. They believe that they're righteous because of the way that they're behaving. And and we talked a little bit about how they like to wear long robes and they wear these little scripture boxes uh, on their foreheads to prove how smart they are and how much they love God and all this kind of stuff. But Jesus calls them sons of the devil and calls them hypocrites. I want to remind you something I said last week. Um, If you are a Christian, even if you screwed up in some area this week, you are not a Pharisee. And you're not a hypocrite, not from a biblical perspective. From from the gospel perspective, Jesus calls those who pretend to know God and don't, he calls those guys hypocrites. So, uh, so here we are, we're people who know God, and yes, there are times that we, that we are going to screw up, uh, but that doesn't make you a hypocrite. You know, you'll hear people say, I don't want to go to church because they're full of hypocrites. They're, technically, they're wrong, um, I'm, unless the church is full of people who are pretending to know God and don't. So the Pharisees are religious people who do not have a relationship with Christ, who do not know God. They are religious people who have no intention of knowing Christ. They're the ones who ultimately want to put Christ to death. And what makes them hypocritical is they declare they know God when in fact they don't. All right? So they're declaring they know God when in fact they don't. And Jesus is reminding the Jews, he's he's told them in Matthew 5.20, like he's looking at this group of Pharisees who are going to stalk him for the next two and a half years because they're trying to find an opportunity to kill him. And he's indicating these Pharisees, and he goes, look, unless you're more righteous than the Pharisees, you'll never see heaven. Unless you're more righteous than the Pharisees, you will never see the kingdom of heaven. And, and so uh, he, Jesus is, what Jesus is doing is he is destroying their view of, of works-based righteousness. What he's doing is he's destroying this idea that you can work good enough and be good enough to be righteous on your own. And so look at uh, 520. I just said it for you, but I'm going to show that it's in the scripture and that I'm not making it up. Jesus says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness is greater than the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Don't let that thought leave your mind as we begin chapter six. All right. So chapter six, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you like the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they can be praised by others. 
that Jesus is speaking of a specific group of people here. He's not speaking with a broad paintbrush. He's not like painting with broad strokes here saying, you know, like, I don't know, some random hypocrites. There is an actual group of people, the Pharisees, who when they give, when they're, when they're making their gifts in the synagogue, uh, that, that what they're doing is they are sounding a trumpet. I want you to picture this, okay? I want you to picture that as, as the, the, the Pharisees are going to the synagogue, they've got, I, I don't know how much it cost them to hire the trumpet player, or maybe they've got a nephew, you know, he's learning it in the school band or whatever, right? And so like, but they have these people who are blowing the trumpets. Why? So that all attention can be turned on them as they give their gift at the synagogue. That was their motive. That was their goal. Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites. Now remember, what Jesus is doing is not giving us as Christians rules for how to behave. What he's doing is he's showing the fallacy of the the Pharisees' righteousness. The Pharisees, you have to remember, like, you and I, if, if you've grown up in church, we know, if you grew up in church, we know that the Pharisees are the bad guys. We know that they're the ones who wanted to kill Jesus. The people in the first century did not know that they were the bad guys. The people in the first century thought that they were the holy guys, that they were the good guys. The people in the first century said, well, I'll never be as good as a Pharisee. And Jesus is going, don't be anything like the Pharisees. That's what Jesus is telling them. So when we read this, we're, it's, it's almost impossible. Like, listen, every human being on the planet is biased. We just are. We can't help it. Uh, your upbringing, your culture, whatever it is, we're biased. We have, we have thoughts and positions that are shaped by our culture, by our parenting, uh, by the homes we grew up in, all of that. If you're a Christian and you've grown up in church, like I have my entire life, 46 years, we read a text like this and we go, oh, we know that the Pharisees are bad guys. And it shapes how we view the text. What we need to remember is Jesus' audience did not know yet that the Pharisees were the bad guys. He's telling them that. He's saying to them, don't be anything like those guys. Because they're giving so that they can be praised by people. They're giving so that people can wow them and be like, oh, man, those guys are amazing. Look at how much they're giving. He's going, don't be anything like them. Look at what he says. Uh, Verse 2 again. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your father... uh, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees what is in secret will reward you. So he's saying the so-called righteous Pharisees, when they give, they're giving with trumpets so that people can pat them on the back. And he says that's the whole reward that they're ever going to get, the praise of people. Now listen, here's where it gets sticky. I'm going to try to prove this to you really, really quickly. This is not Jesus telling Christians how to give. All my life, I've heard people teach this text. I can't say all my life. For the last 25 years, I've been the preacher. So uh, for for the first 21 years of my life, I heard people preach this text as, now be sure when you give, you do it in secret so that no one knows. Okay, that is not what Jesus is saying. And here's how we know that that's not what Jesus is saying. You ready? Because in Acts chapter 4 and 5, the early church, when they were all meeting together in Acts chapter 4 and 5, Whenever they found out that there was a need among them, they would stand in front of the rest of the group and they go, who has something that we can give? And they were piling up. People were just coming up in front of the group going, hey, we, we have something that can help meet that need. And they were giving very publicly to the, the needs of the church. Not only that, in Corinthians, Paul uh, wrote to the, the Macedonian, or sorry, wrote to the Corinthian church and he said, hey, uh, remember that gift you were going to si- send to Jerusalem to help out during the time of famine? He goes, I've been bragging about you to the Macedonians. I've been telling the Macedonian churches, the churches in Philippi, the churches of Thessalonica, I've been telling all of them about how generous your, your gift was. Like, Paul told everybody about everybody's gifts. Why? Because it was a source of encouragement. Anybody in here ever been blessed by somebody else's gift to you? They got you through a tight spot. They're the ones that helped you pay next month's rent, whatever it was. We're blessed and what we do is we tell our friends, listen to how God provided, man, God used this people as a blessing, right? The whole New Testament, like, I mean, in Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas raise a whole bunch of money in Antioch, take the 300 mile journey, walking or donkey or whatever, down to Jerusalem. And they're like, hey guys, we brought you a whole bunch of gifts from the people in Antioch because we wanted to bless you guys. Like no one, no one in the church age in, in the book of Acts 
in, in, in any of in, in the book of Ephesians or Romans or Corinthians, no one gave in secret. They were all giving as a they were like, hey, I just I just want you to know, like this is I want to bless you. Like it was it was a an encouragement to the whole body, right? We want you guys to know that if you have a need, we want to help take care of you. And listen, like th- that's just part of it. So what Jesus is doing here is not giving Christians instructions on how to give. What Jesus is doing here is he's making the Pharisees the bad guys. And he's going, look, guys, don't be like the, don't be like the Pharisees. They're not actually righteous. Those guys aren't actually righteous. Look at how they give. they give. They give so that they can be praised by men. And Jesus is addressing a heart issue. He goes, let your giving be, and he's talking to the Jews here, let your giving be so that your praise comes from God. Let your giving be so that your praise comes from God. Look at this. Chapter uh, 6, verse 5. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they can be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they think they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespass. All right. Think through this. Listen to the text, okay? So the guys who everyone says are righteous, the Pharisees, when they're praying, they're praying on the corner so everyone can see them. They're praying out in public. Why? Don't don't look at where their prayer happens. Look at why their prayer happens in public. Why? So they can be seen. So they can be praised. Uh, I preached at a church back in 2000. I was 25 and I had been invited to this church to speak as a revival, uh, do a, a week-long revival or whatever. And the pastor and I just didn't get along from, like, our first time we met on Saturday night. And, uh, and it was interesting because when he would talk to you, he would talk like this. But whenever he would go to pray, he would do this really theatrical voice. And he would grab the corners of the pulpit and be like, oh, our dearest Lord God. Who? And I was just like, the first time it like freaked me out. I'm down there on the front row getting ready to preach and he's going to pray. And I went, oh, you know, like it just, I was like, that's, that's not how he talks. That's different. It was noticeably different, you know? It was just different, you know? And, 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 and so these guys, I don't know, they probably don't pray at home, these Pharisees, they pray where? They pray out on the street corner so they can be seen, so that they can be seen as pious, so they can be seen as righteous. Because here's the thing, the Pharisees are not actually interested in real righteousness, which comes through faith in Jesus, which comes through a relationship with God. The Pharisees are only interested in perceived righteousness. They only want to be looked at as righteous. And so they're praying out in public so they can all be seen. Now, growing up, again, first 21 years, uh, growing up, and probably I've heard other preachers since then, but like uh, a, a lot of people preach, this is how you should pray. And, and this is what Jesus says, right? This then is how you should pray. Keep in mind his audience is Jewish, but he says, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we have also forgiven our trespassers or those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, Luke adds, uh, for that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, and some, some add it in Matthew. And so, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Here's how you should pray. This is, and, and I, I got to tell you, growing up, I, I would hear people say, oh, when you pray, remember the word joy. And that's how you pray. We've talked about this on our podcast. Uh, but here, and this is the instruction. This is how they taught me when I was a kid. You pray about Jesus. Joy, right? J, Jesus. See how that works? It's an acronym. And, and you say, all right, God, Jesus, this is who you are. And then O is for others. Then you can pray for others. But only after you first prayed for, you know, praising Jesus. And then Y, you can finally at the end pray for yourself. Okay? Other people go, no, 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 no. It's, it's Acts. It's the book of Acts. That's how you pray. You give adoration to God and then confess your sins and then thanksgiving 
And then finally, supplication. Then you can pray for what you need. I, I, I'm just going to, spoilers ahead, okay? If you haven't read the whole Bible yet, spoilers, okay? I don't, I don't want to ruin it for you. But by my count, and this is just my count, okay? You, I, I'll be, I can gladly be wrong. Not counting the book of Psalms, there are 156 prayers in the Bible, okay? Not counting the book of Psalms, there are 156 prayers in the Bible. Now, some of those you might go, well, Ryan, that's not really a prayer. But if, if someone was talking to God, I count it as a prayer, okay? And, and so 156 prayers in the Bible, I've outlined every one of them. Not a single one of them follows this pattern, not one. And that includes the prayers of Jesus. This is how we know that this is not instruction to a Christian on how to pray. What is Jesus doing? He is saying, those guys that you think are righteous are not righteous. They're only doing what they're doing so they can get the pats on the back. He goes, you do what you do so that you can receive praise from God. He is shifting the perspective away from quit looking good in front of people and make your affection be about who Jesus is, about who God is. And he is shifting their perspective away from we look righteous to everybody else to I have a heart for God. The Pharisees didn't have a heart for God. Christian, I, 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 I cannot preach this enough. I don't think I'll ever tire of preaching this. You are not bound by works of the law for righteousness. Christ shed his blood on the cross, and righteousness comes through him and him alone. Put faith in Jesus. Put your trust in Jesus. Put your confidence in Jesus. And if you've been beating yourself up for a decade like I used to because you didn't pray correctly, remember that this isn't Jesus telling us as Christians how to pray. This is Jesus making the point that the Pharisees are not righteous. That what they're doing is wicked. This isn't in, 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 like give. You want to give in secret? Fine. Give in secret. But sometimes the body needs to be encouraged by your gift. It, it, it encourages us. The Corinthians' gift encouraged the Macedonians who were poor to give. Why? Because they knew that the Corinthian church was giving. And, and they were like, wow, the Corinthian church is really generous. I want to be generous. I want to give like they're giving. Like, we, we as a family, we, we've got to quit thinking of the, the body of Christ. We've got to quit thinking of this as a contest. And start thinking of this as a single organism, a single body, that when we together are all doing what we're supposed to be doing according to our gifts and according to our strengths, we are actually encouraging and strengthening one another towards Christ's likeness. Like, I I am sorry if you have been, I'm genuinely sorry. This isn't a sarcastic sorry, right? I noticed my voice sounded a little like, oh, I'm so sorry, but that's not how I meant it. I, I mean, like, I am genuinely sorry if, if the, the way that you have done life has been shaped by the law and it has crippled you and left you feeling insufficient, here's the really great news in our insufficiency. Christ isn't insufficient. And we find full satisfaction in him. And what Jesus is doing, please remember this. And if you weren't here last week, you can't remember it because you weren't here for me to tell it to you. But, but I'll tell you now, what Jesus is doing in chapters 5 and 6 is he is saying, you Jews have a standard of righteousness that isn't righteousness. And he is ripping apart their entire worldview so that they'll come to the question, which we'll talk about next week, of what do we do then? If the Pharisees aren't righteous, if praying this way isn't righteous, if giving this way isn't righteous, what do we do then? And Jesus goes, hello, (laughs) me, you know, here I am, I'm the answer, right? Like Jesus is stripping away everything that they're putting their hope in so that when they hit bottom and they go, I don't know what righteousness is then, Jesus can go, me, I'm righteousness (laughs) right here. You want it? It's yours. That's what he's doing. Look at... uh, Look at fasting in the next verse. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites do. Remember, specific group of people that he's talking about when he's calling these people hypocrites. The only people in the entire Gospels that Jesus ever calls hypocrites are those who pretend to know Jesus who don't. Uh, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting can be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward in full. But when you fast... Anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what's in secret will reward you. So the Pharisees are giving with trumpets, praying on the streets, 
and making their faces look really sad when they're fasting, you know? They're like being really depressed about it. And, and they're doing that for one reason. It's outlined in all three of these passages that we've just looked at. They're doing that for one reason. That's two fingers. One reason. So that people will pat them on the back and go, wow, look at those guys. Man, those guys are really righteous. And Jesus is going, man, that's not righteousness. Remember, he's told them back in 520, unless you're more righteous than the Pharisees, you'll never see heaven. And then he's showing them how what the Pharisees are doing is actually hypocritical. Why? They don't actually care about God. They don't have a relationship with God. They only care about what people think. Right? If you're only giving for what people will think, if you're only praying for what people will think, if you're only coming to church, if you're only fasting, if you're only doing those things uh, for what people will think, then something is off in your heart. So in all three of these places, they have the reward. What's the reward? Their reward is the praise of men. The, the truth is that the Pharisees are more interested in the praise of men than they are uh, the glory of God. Look at John. You don't have to look at John. You can just write this down if you want to, if you're a note taker. But in John 12, I'm going to read 42 through 43. Many of the authorities even believed in Christ, but for fear of the Pharisees, they wouldn't confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God. Many of the Pharisees, many of the authorities, sorry, rather, believed in Christ, but for fear of the Pharisees did not confess it, for they would, did not want to be put out of the synagogue. See, the Pharisees have already said, anyone who says Jesus is God can't come into the synagogue anymore. Anybody who acknowledges Jesus as the Son of God, anybody who acknowledges Jesus as the Savior is cast out of the synagogue. They can't come into the synagogue anymore. We see that actually in, in John chapter 9. Jesus heals a man who had been born blind, Right? And when the Pharisees are questioning, they're like, who is the guy? Who, who healed you? And he goes, Jesus. Like, they, he, he must be God. And they throw him out of the synagogue. When, when his parents come, they come to interview his parents. They're like, was this your kid? Was this the kid that was born blind? And the parents are like, uh, yeah. And they're like, how did he come to be seeing then? And the parents wouldn't say anything. The parents are not, get this. The parents, whose son is about 40 years old, who's been born blind, now see their son seeing because he's had an encounter with Jesus, and they deny that because they're more concerned about what the Pharisees and the synagogue rulers are going to say. So they go, well, we, we don't know. Ask him. Because the parents don't want to be cast out of the synagogue. I need you to understand something here. This is another cultural difference. When it says many people believed in Jesus, but they wouldn't confess him, believe there isn't Christian. They, they believed something about him. They believed he was a good prophet. They believed he was a, from God. They believed something about him, but they're not willing to confess him. And what, is it, what does the text say there in verse 43? They love more the opinion of men, the glory of men, than they do the glory of God. That's, that's not faith. That's not righteousness. They're more scared of the so-called righteous Pharisees than they are. They're, they're like, ah, can you imagine? Like, it boggles my brain. It boggles my brain. Uh, we talked about this several weeks ago. Uh, no, we talked about it at, at kids camp. That's why it's fresh in my brain. It boggles my brain that there can be 16 soldiers guarding the tomb of Jesus. They, have, they see the earthquake. They see the angel roll away the stone. And Jesus come out, and they're able to be bought off. And they're able to, like, their boss said, hey, look, just say that his, his disciples came and stole him. Here's some money. And there was an amount of money that was enough for them to go, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to say some guys stole him. They saw it. With their own eyes. There are people who see Jesus do amazing things. And the reason they don't ever come to him, really truly come to him in faith is why? Because they love the glory of men more than the glory of God. Listen to this. This is from John chapter 5. Oh, man. I, uh, I want to read this huge section in here, but I, I just we don't have time for it. So pick up with me in 537. John 5 verse 37. Jesus says this. He says, The Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, and his form you have never seen. You do not have the word of God abiding in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. 
yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you receive him well enough. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Catch this. Jesus is explaining to these people that he's God, and he's going, you don't believe me, though. And the reason you don't believe that I'm God is because you don't really know God. The reason that you don't believe I came from God is because you don't really know the God you say you know. He's talking to the hypocrites, okay? He's talking to the people who are walking around going, we know God. And he's going, no, you really don't. Because if you knew God, you'd know me. Because God tells the whole world who I am, that I'm the Savior. He goes, you say you know the scriptures, but you don't know the scriptures because the scriptures tell everybody who I am. And so who's he talking to here? Not bad Christians, not Christians who are brand new to the faith, not Christians who didn't read their Bible this week, to people who say, we know God, but they don't actually know God. And listen to what he says. And how can you believe? I lost it. Where is it? Yeah, verse 44. And how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory for that comes from the only God? How could you possibly, possibly believe when the chief desire of your heart is that you would receive praise from men instead of praise from God? Jesus is saying that somebody whose chief desire is praise from men does not know him and cannot know him. Because what does the chief desire have to be? That we would receive our praise and our glory from God. So that, that's what's happening in Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, he's going, guys, quit looking at these hypocrites as the example. They don't actually know God. He goes, their, their only concern is the glory of men. Their only concern is how people will praise them. Their only concern is what people will say about them. They don't know God. And he's not doing this as Christian instruction. He's doing this to strip away works-based righteousness so that they'll be left there going, okay, then what do we do? And then he can say, I'm the solution. I'm the means for righteousness. I'm the means for life. Again, spoiler, please come back next week because I think it's going to be really fun. But in chapter 7, when Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be given open to you, he's talking about righteousness. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about life. It, the Pharisees aren't the means for righteousness. Praying in the street corner, giving with trumpets. Uh, listen, I, I, I don't know, like, I don't know. What, what, it wouldn't be a trumpet around here. What would it be? A harmonica, you know, or something? You know, a guitar and harmonica, you know? Like, uh, so, you know, I, I want to say banjo, but I don't feel like we're East Texas enough for banjo, you know? If you play the banjo, no offense. I'm not trying to pick on you. I think that's pretty cool, actually. But I'm just saying, like, we're, that's a little East Texas for us. If you grew up in East Texas, you know, that's fine. Uh, I've, I've spent some time there. Uh, Don't, and for some of us, it's going to be a shift. For some of us, it's going to be a shift. For me, it was a huge shift six years ago. Don't let these texts be interpreted in your heart as this is instruction on how we should behave. Let it be interpreted as this is Jesus removing the Jews' faulty view of works-based righteousness. This is Jesus stripping away what they had set up as their standard. Has anybody in here ever uh, has anybody in here ever done something wrong? It worked, like it worked, or you thought that it worked, and then somebody comes along and shows you an easier way, yeah. and you're like, "Oh, okay, wow, okay, yeah," you know, or, or like you have this elaborate plan. Like Micah, Micah has this ability. When we walked into this building a little over two years ago, when we walked into this building and it was uh, old and outdated and had been left here for two years. Uh, Micah walked in, and as we were driving back into town after we had walked through, he goes, man, I can see it, and here's what we're going to do, and we're going to put a wall here, and we're going to do this. And, like, and so if you didn't see this building before, the way it looks now is how Micah envisioned it the first day we saw it. Like, uh, there were a few things that we had to change in it, but Micah can just see it. I can't, right? So in my head, uh, I, I, get, I get locked into something. Like, I, I think, well, this is the way that something's going to be done, and here's how it needs to be done, and I get locked into it. And so when we were talking about doing the coffee bar back there, uh, there's, uh, it was going to be a lot smaller, and then we realized we didn't need that back room, so we were going to knock down the whole wall. And I kept going, well, what about this, and what about this? And Mikey goes, Ryan. He goes, stop. <laughs> he goes, yesterday, 
We were talking about having a really small coffee bar. Today we're talking about having a big coffee bar. Yesterday's plans don't fit today's schedule. <laughs> In my head, I was still thinking about, yeah, but what about the thing we talked about? He goes, all that's gone because we're doing something different now. And, I, and it took me a second to kind of go, oh, okay. <laughs> and just, you know, I, I, I have to, I am best with Micah when we're working on something because I'm not creative like that, uh, to just go, you just, just tell me what to do because he sees it, right? Well, the, the Jews are a lot like me in the sense that they kind of have been locked into this position of righteousness. Righteousness is the Pharisees. Righteousness is works. I've been told my whole life I'm never going to be good enough. I've been told my life I don't pray like I should. I've been told my whole life I don't give like I should. I don't fast as often as the Pharisees do. Well, how often do the Pharisees fast? I don't know, but that one dude has ashes on his head every day, so I'm guessing he fasts every day. You know, like I don't give as much as the Pharisees do. Well, how do you know how much the Pharisees give? Well, that guy, did you see him yesterday? With he had a whole band. Like you know, he must have given a lot. You know, or whatever. And and so what they're feeling is guilt, and what they're feeling is condemnation, and what they're feeling is that they're not enough. And then Jesus shows up and he goes, hey, that standard over there, that's not actually righteousness. And if you live like that, you'll never see heaven. And the Jews went, wait, what? But I thought, and he goes, quit thinking the way you used to think. We're doing something new. And the new thing is grace. The new thing is that righteousness is a gift. And it's not actually new, but it was new to their mindset. They had never been raised that way. They didn't comprehend that. They didn't understand that. And I got to tell you guys, even though every one of you in here, if we went down and sat down and had lunch, and if I said, do you believe righteousness is a matter of grace? You would say, yes. I promise you that on some level, we're still trying to work it out on our own. On some level, we're still trying to be good enough. Christ is good enough. And Christ's good enough is way better than your best could ever be. And Jesus came in and he goes, quit thinking in this narrow perspective. These guys that you think are righteous aren't. Now remember, this is going to be six sermons for us. This was 15 minutes for Jesus. So it made a lot more sense when he's going, that's not righteous and that's not righteous. And those guys aren't righteous. And they're sitting there going, well, what is? And he goes, I am. Listen to me. Believe me. Hear me. Follow my words. Follow my teachings. And in the space of 15 minutes, your brains are just exploding all over the place because you're like, whoa, what? It's going to take us six weeks to walk through it because, you know, I'm not Jesus. <laughs> but get your mind right that what Jesus is doing here is he is showing them that the glory of man, the praise of men, that uh, the self-made righteousness fails. Our application is this. Seek the reward that is eternal and found in God and the faith that is rooted in Christ. Seek the reward that is eternal and found in God and the faith that is rooted in Christ. If you'll look back at chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Pause there for just a minute. Don't, don't rip this out of the context. Don't make this your retirement fund. Don't make this your career. Don't make this your home. Don't make this your clothes or your car. Don't rip it out of the context. In the three previous texts, the Pharisees have their reward now. The Pharisees have their reward now. The Pharisees have their reward now. What was the reward? The praise of men. Looking good in front of everybody. So what does he say here? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where rust and, uh, can destroy and thieves can break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Listen to what he just said in context. Where was the Pharisee's heart? Not with God. With the praise of men. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And he is shifting the people, those who are listening to him, those who weren't trying to throw him off the cliff earlier in the day. Remember, all of this has taken space in like an hour. He preached in a synagogue. They tried to kill him. He went over to another hillside. These guys are following along. And the Pharisees, cynical murdering Pharisees, are coming along going, let's see what he's going to say now. And he goes, listen, you guys who are still here, I need to tell you something. Those guys over there, they're not righteous. I need you to know that they don't even know who God is. 
I need you to know that wherever your treasure is, there your heart is, and their treasure is your praise. And I want your treasure to be God's praise. And he is, he's decimating. The word decimate gets used wrong all the time. Okay? Decimate, deci, a tenth. It's like when something is like 90% destroyed. It's, it, it, it's not like, man, you really killed me in that game. Like decimation is bad. Like, not bad, but it's, it is catastrophic. And what Jesus is doing is decimating their view of righteousness, crushing it so that they can go, what do we, what do we have then? If, if those guys aren't even righteous, what chance do I have? And Jesus is getting ready to give them the answer that it's about him. He's telling them, he's telling them that the treasure should be in God. And then he gives two more phrases that are also meant to shame the Pharisees and give this body of people hope. He says in verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Uh, Mammon is kind of a personification of those things that have value and worth. And anyway, like it's, it's not just money. I mean, there were plenty of rich believers, so it's not that. It, it's this idea that, remember what he's doing. You have this group of Pharisees. You have these people whose treasure isn't in heaven. It's on earth because all they want is the praise for men. You have this group of people whose eyes are not set on God. It's set on darkness. It's set on self. You have this group of people who are more concerned about lining their pockets than they are the kingdom of heaven. You have the, this group, of, and he's going, that isn't righteousness. Think about it like this. All of us, I mean, if you've ever seen a TV or an 80s sitcom or a 90s movie or whatever, at some point, you have seen the spoof of the charlatan pastor, the fake guy, the guy who's some movie, something about the guy who's lining his pockets. And we know that they're not just spoofs, that they actually happen, right? That there are preachers who are just going around lining their pockets, offering false righteousness to people, offering false hope. to people. We know that that happens, right? And if somebody came to you and said, hey, that false preacher, that guy who's actually hurting people and fleecing them and taking all of their retirement and doing all this stuff, that guy's not actually a representation of Christ. We would all go, well, duh. We would do that. What you need to comprehend is, in a similar fashion, that's what's happening in the first century, except for the Jews believed that that was true. They believed that the Pharisees were right. They believed that that was the way for godliness and holiness. They believed that that was the way to the kingdom of heaven. They believed that. And so Jesus is having to come in and go, listen, I, none of that is real. I'm what's real. The praise of men is not real. The praise of God is what's real. Remember, we just read it a minute ago, John 5, right? He goes, how could you ever believe when you care more about the glory of men than you do the glory of God? So that's what's happening here in Matthew 6. And this should be an incredible encouragement to us because this is not Jesus telling them how to behave. This is Jesus shifting their heart perspective away from an example of let everybody praise you to an example of let God be the one who brings you glory. I will say this. If you're a Christian here today, if you've put your faith in Jesus, you are not, by Jesus' standards, a hypocrite. Even if you really were terrible this week. You are not, by Jesus' standards, a hypocrite because Jesus uses the term hypocrite to talk about those who pretend to know God but don't. Okay, keep that in mind. But I do want us to know that, like, it is, I, I, think, that, I, I think that at some point or another, it becomes easy for us to do things so that we look a certain way, you know? Um, we want to pray a certain way so that people think we're, like, I'm embarrassed to pray in front of people. I just am. I, I don't feel like I pray well in front of people, and it just embarrasses me. It makes me incredibly uncomfortable. I've been a preacher for 26 years, and I don't like praying in front of people. Because then I, I'm always thinking, did I sound smart? 
<laughs> did I sound like I was praying well, you know? I, did, did it sound like I was sincere, you know? And, I'm, and I get too much in my own head. And I just want to remind us this morning that we are not living for the glory and the praise of people. We're not hypocrites. We know who the real God is. And we are living for his praise and his glory, right? So our prayer today is this. God, give us the discipline to live our lives not for the glory of men, but for your glory. God, give us the discipline to live our lives not for the glory of men, but for your glory. Not talking here about whether you actually know God. I'm assuming that you do. I'm, I, I am, that's a given for me in this conversation. What I'm saying is that sometimes we still have the temptation to like want to look good, you know? I, I, we want to, I don't know. We want people to think that we're something, you know? But we know, we know. I'm, I'm assuming the best about all of us, okay? We know that our real treasure is in heaven. We know that our real reward is Christ. We know that the real glory comes from God. And so God, give us the discipline to live not for the glory of people, but for yours. Take just a moment, would you, to pray that right where you are? Just spend a little bit of time in prayer. God, first of all, I praise your name that you are the source of our righteousness. I praise your name that you are the source of our holiness. I thank you, God, that it is not based on our works that we are saved. God, that we don't have to earn your pleasure, that we don't have to win at righteousness, that it is by your good grace and your mercy and your kindness your love, your benevolence, God, and through faith that we can be righteous today. That because of the work of Christ on the cross, because of the empty tomb, because he is God, because his blood was shed, because he overthrew death and overthrew sin, and we stand here today and we say we believe that, our faith is in that, our confidence is in that, that God now, his righteousness has become ours. We have the very righteousness of Christ. I thank you for that. I pray, God, that you would help us to remember that. That we would cease striving for righteousness and we would rest in you. God, that we would trust that the Holy Spirit that's at work in our lives is conforming us more and more into your likeness and that the things in our lives that do not measure up to you, God, that you will purge them from us. And that you will conform us to your image until the day we stand before Jesus, perfect and whole and complete. God, when we, when we read texts like Matthew 5 and 6, let them be an encouragement to us rather than condemnation to us. Let us rejoice that all things fall squarely at your feet and on your shoulders by your power and your provision that flow out of your mercy and your love. And God, let us, let us be people who proclaim that, who declare that to a world that is very weary, to a world that continues to submit themselves to self-made righteousness and works as a means to attaining God. 
and let us proclaim out of grace and love and glory and beauty that righteousness is found in Jesus alone. It is in your name that we pray and in the hope and the love that you have given us that we rejoice and we say amen and amen.